How's it going? Y'all good? Okay. This is a baseball bat. Well, actually, this is a softball bat. See, I'm going to have to get my, I had, I had a story and now I'm gonna, they're going to fact check me. Can you hold everything till the end? And then, okay. Because I played baseball in high school, but I was the worst player on the team. I was no good. Was no good. You know, the coach went around and they were like, man, so-and-so, man, I love your bat, your batting skills. You're awesome, and, and so-and-so, man, your glove, your shortstop skills are incredible. Robert, you got heart. <laughs> <laughs> I'm okay with it. It's not my gifting. Whenever you get told you got heart, just... Some of you are like, oh, that's what he meant? <laughs> nah, you got heart. You bring heart. Anyway, I was preparing for this message, and I'm going to be talking about there's a difference between gazing on something and glancing at something. When you gaze on something, it means your focus is on it. When you glance at something, it means you just kind of take a look, but you're back. And I, 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 want, to, I want to share with you that today in Christianity, sometimes we set our gaze on the wrong thing. We set our gaze on things that we shouldn't be, that we should be glancing at. And we, and we glance at things that we should be gazing at. So when you go to, when, when, I, when, when I played ball, and this might be why I was no good, but when I played ball, I would get up, and, and our third base coach, there was a coach on the third base line, and he always gave me a sign, whether to take the pitch, bunt, swing away. Third base over here. But if I, I realized that if, if I set my gaze on the coach, then I wasn't going to have my eye on the ball. And in order to, hit, in order to, to be successful, you got to keep your eye on the ball. Whether you're fielding or whether you're batting, the whole thing is your gaze has to be on the ball. You got to keep your, your eyes on the ball. And sometimes I was sitting there and I would look at the third base coach and listen, if, you, if I set my gaze on the third base coach and I'm looking at third base and my eye's not on the pitcher that's going to throw the ball, I'm not going to hit the ball. But even the pitcher who had the ball, if you're not careful, you'll set your gaze on the pitcher. But, and you got you to gotta glance at the pitcher, but once he releases the ball, you got to keep your eye off the pitcher and on the ball. Are y'all with me? The ball is like the word of God. See, today, I'm the pitcher. And if you came in here with something in you, you can't set your gaze on me. If you set your gaze on me, I'm just here to deliver the pitch. If you set your gaze on me, you will miss what God has for you. If you don't like my suit or you're saying, man, he's gained weight, you haven't seen me in a while, your gaze is not on the right thing. See, in this church, we believe in mentoring and in discipleship, and we assign mentors to people. Your third base coach is like a mentor. If your gaze is on your mentor and not on the ball, you're not going to hit the ball. And, and I'm going to tell you something, that if, if your, your mentor wants you to hit the ball, your third base coach is giving you signs, not so that you'll look at him and set your gaze on him, but so that you'll be ready to set your gaze on the ball so that you can hit it out of the park for the kingdom of God. So what, what do you have your gaze on today? Can I help you with something? If you have your gaze on me, I have the potential to let you down. But the ball, the word, Jesus, will never let you down. The third base coach, he's got the potential to let you down. See, the devil roams around to try to get your gaze on the wrong thing. And if he can get you off the word, he's got you. And if he can get you about just focusing on a person, focusing on a man, you know, sometimes I'm all about discipleship and I'm all about mentoring, and you should call your mentor and you should have a close relationship with your mentor, but that should not be your first call. You should get on your knees and call on the Lord first. 
and your mentor confirms the word that God wants, because God wants to speak to you. He doesn't just want to speak to me as the leader. He doesn't want to speak to the mentors. He wants to speak to you individually if you're in here today. What do you have your gaze on? We're going to be in the book of Luke, chapter 10, if you have your Bible. It's a story that everybody knows. It's called the story, the, the, the Good Samaritan story. Let me give you a little preface of this thing. There's a road from Jerusalem to Jericho, and Jesus starts telling a story about a guy that was going down that road and got robbed and got beat and got left in the ditch. So there's a guy, he's broken, he's down on the ditch, he's wounded, bruised up, and the first person to come across this guy is a priest, the Bible says. And Jesus says that a priest comes up, and as he's walking up to this guy and he sees the guy in the ditch, the first reaction of the priest is to cross the street to the other side and ignore the guy in the ditch, and he went on his way. The second guy on the scene did no better. He was a Levite. He was from the tribe of Levi. He had, some, he had some credentials that had to do with his lineage. And so he came across that same situation of a guy in the ditch. And when he walked up to the guy in the ditch, he crossed to the other side. They didn't want to be bothered by the guy in the ditch. Can, can I, I'm going to make something really plain. Something the Lord showed me is that the guy in the ditch is humanity without Christ. The guy in the ditch was me when I didn't have Jesus. Beat up by the world, left for dead, dying if somebody didn't show up to do something. The priest represents religion. See, religion will always cause you to cross the street. Religion will run up on something and say, I can't be late to church. The Levite represents legalism. The Levite, this is what I, I see with the Levite. He walks up on the situation and he says, well, he probably deserves to be in the ditch. He probably did something to be in the ditch. And that will cause you to cross the street. Can I tell you, church, that that's not? the image of the Father. And, and I'm, before, you get, before, you, before you let yourself off the hook and you say, well, I'm not religious and I'm not legalistic, we all have the tendency to slide into religion and to slide into legalism. And we justify it. Can I help you? Is it, is it okay if we tell the truth today? Because we need to tell the truth because we've got to get out of that situation. See, religion and legalism will always cause you to lose your mercy and your compassion. The title of this message is Growing in Your Compassion. How do you grow in compassion for people? How do you see, when you see the guy in the ditch, how do you not look at it and say, man, I'm too busy to deal with that? Come on, in the church, pastors, I'm going to tell you, Sometimes, sometimes as pastors, we've got to not get so busy that we can't share the gospel, that we can't visit somebody that's in hospice, that we can't visit the people that are hurting. We, 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 we can get into this thing where I've got to preach and I've got to get ready and I'm so busy. And what we're doing is we're crossing the street and we're expecting somebody else to come along and to pick that person up. If you're a leader in the house today, I'm telling you, don't allow religion to slide in. You're not too busy. You were made for that. You'll probably get more, out of, more in a message prep there than you will in your study. We want to get in our closets. We want to get in our, in our home studies with our books and our commentaries. And God is saying, man, I want you to get outside of those four walls and roll up your sleeves and get in the thick of the battle. And I'll give you your messages and they'll be fresh and anointed. And it'll bring me glory. I love this because <laughs> then the Samaritan showed up. You know, when I think of the Samaritan, the Samaritan was, you know, the Jews despised the Samaritan. There's a whole history there all the way back to their captivity. They didn't like them. They intermarried. Uh, they, there's a, a slew of reasons. 
But as I was looking at it, I was like, you know, the Samaritan represents the one you would least expect. I love, I, this is the church of the ones you would least expect. It's okay. What? You've offended me. No. God works through the ones you least expect. The ones who can't take any glory for anywhere they are. The ones that will sit and tell you, I don't even know how this happened. It just happened. God's favor's on me. His anointing's on me. God's opened doors for me. The least one that you would expect, he walks up and he doesn't cross the street. <laughs> he walks up to this guy in the ditch. You know what I think? I, I, think, I think one of the most powerful things that you can do as a believer is to never forget your ditch experience. See, when you get religious and legal, legalistic, you, you, you begin to, to forget that you once were in the ditch. You once needed somebody to show up and care. You needed somebody that was growing in compassion, that had the ability to give you mercy and grace. You needed somebody to show up for you. And sometimes we start, we start worshiping God, we get pulled out of the ditch, and we forget that we once resided in the ditch. I got more ditch stories than you. My wife says I'm still in the ditch. But anyway, just, I'm kidding. Sometimes I still kind of slap. I got to pull that sucker over on the road. Keep it in there. The worst thing to do is to be in the ditch and not know you're in the ditch. But that Samaritan shows up to this thing. I'm going to read you in Luke 10, verse 33. He says, I'm going to read the scripture. But the Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was. And when he saw him, everybody underlined saw him, when he saw him, he had compassion on him. And the Bible says, and went to him. Everybody say, went to him. Went. So he not only saw him, he went to him. And he bound up his wounds, pouring in oil and wine. And then he set him on his own donkey and, and brought him to an inn. And took care of him. Somebody say, take care of him. So he not only saw him and he not only went to him, but he was willing to take care of him. Some, of, some people would think, well, that's the same thing. No, it's not. Because you can see something and cross the road. You can see something show up and do nothing. <laughs> Come on, the Samaritan didn't walk up, walk up. Oh, man, there's a guy in the ditch. Pastor Robert, I got a guy in the ditch over here. I'm going to send you a pin. He didn't call the church to tell somebody, hey, there's a guy in the ditch. Y'all might want to come look at him. He took ownership. He took ownership. See, sometimes that in the church, we think it's up to the pastor, to the life group leader, to the person leading the Bible study, to the evangelist, to the, to the person, to the outreach guys. No, listen, when you walk up on that person in the ditch, you have been called to that moment. You have been called to that moment yourself. God has empowered you. The same Holy Spirit that's on the inside of you is on the inside of every other minister in the church. You have the authority because Christ ascended and you're seated with him. You don't get Holy Ghost Junior. You have the ability to make a difference and transform the world. So that Samaritan walks up. It's the least person you would expect, and he steps in and he steps out. Here's the, here's, here's the three things that I see in this scripture. The first thing is he saw him. Now listen, the priest saw him, the Levite saw him, but the Samaritan saw him. Three people saw him, but one person responded to what he saw differently. Why? Because he had revelation. He saw what God saw. See, there are a lot of people seeing things, but are you seeing it like God sees it? 
And if we get in our religion and we get in our religious ways and we start coming to church and we're, we're excited because we've made every Sunday this month and we've checked the box offs and we've put, put our post up that we are in church, but we don't see how God sees. See, I believe that there's a process to seeing how God sees. And the first thing that has to happen is there has to be a personal consecration. Can I, <laughs> listen, church, everybody in here, we are required to be consecrated if we belong to him. There's a requirement as the believer to live a consecrated life. What do I mean by that? I mean that there's, there's a requirement to live it out in your home on your own. There's a requirement for personal worship, for personal devotion. There's a requirement for personal uh, uh, word reading. And if our gaze is not on those things, then we will not see how Jesus sees. We have to set our gaze on the word of God, on the things of God. Because if our gaze gets on our circumstance, come on somebody, so this is the, the plight of the believer, is we're all going through something. Can I, can, listen, I know they look really good next to you right now, they smell good, they got a suit on, but they're probably going through something. I know you thought you were coming to the place where every, nobody's going through something, but I guarantee you if we went around the room, everybody's going through something. Somebody's got a circumstance in here. I've got a circumstance. You've got a circumstance. And if I set my gaze on my circumstance, I will not see how God sees. Regardless of my circumstance, I've got to set my gaze on his word. And when I set my gaze on his word, all of a sudden I begin to see things differently. The world is not going to be changed by people with no circumstances. The world is changed by people with circumstances that choose to rise above the circumstance and put their gaze on the word of God and say, let the devil be a liar, but God is true. If you're waiting for the perfect people to show up to solve everything, you're going to be waiting a long time. God uses imperfect people, Samaritans, that'll just say yes in a moment. When we see like he sees, it sets our focus on the mission, and when we, what we see enters the mind, and then it produces an action. Come on, it enters the mind, produces an action. You know, how, that, you know that works in the world? Advertising is built on creating an image. It's the most powerful thing that a person can do is create an image. You run down the road, you see a Whataburger uh, billboard. Anybody like Whataburger? Okay, or In-N-Out, whatever. I don't know. But Whataburger. So all of a sudden you see the Whataburger, the billboard, and then you start noticing, man, there's a Whataburger. And then you're driving home and you're see, you actually see the Whataburger. But you're not seeing the W, you're seeing the image of that wa mouth-watering Whataburger on the screen. Am I making you hungry? So you set your gaze on that billboard because they know that the world knows there's something to what you set your gaze on. Mm -hmm. He knows there's something to the image. So you set your gaze on there, and pretty soon you're like looking at that, that billboard, and then you're looking at the Whataburger. And then you go home, and it's like they know, and the Whataburger commercial comes on. <laughs> and before you know it, you don't know what happened, but you're in line at Whataburger. <laughs> getting you a number one with jalapenos. Because <laughs> it matters what you see. It matters what you see. They use it in the world to sell product. But the Lord created us that way. The Lord said, I'm gonna get, I want you to see me. I want you to see who I am in my word. I want you to read it. I want you to eat it. I want you to meditate on it. I want you to gaze on it so much that every time you look up from me, you just see what I see. And compassion will begin to rise. See, compassion doesn't come from your flesh, people, folks. I don't have compassion for people automatically. If you're having compassion, it's God. It's God in us. So the first thing he said is he saw him. 
So he saw him. The second thing he did is he went to him. He had the courage to not, to cross, to not cross over. Come on, that Samaritan could have been walking up. It could have been a setup. It could have been a guy laying in the ditch saying, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to draw him in and rob him. How many of you know it takes courage to serve God? It takes courage to walk up on. It takes courage to go to Trinity. It takes courage to go to Mary Jo Peckham and hoop it up over there. You get shot over there. You think, oh, everybody's like, we're in Katy. Hey, have you been here lately? <laughs> There's stuff going on. There's evil everywhere. There's, there's wrongdoing everywhere. It takes courage to get out and to share the gospel with a group of people that possibly don't want to hear it for the sake of one wanting to hear it. It takes courage. We, listen, church, if we can't see like he sees, we won't have the compassion, and the compassion won't drive us and give us the courage. We can't just drum. You see, courage is not the absence of fear. Just because you're courageous doesn't mean that, you're, that you don't have any fear. It means that you're walking through your fear. You're pushing through your fear. You're pushing through things. You're going towards it. And, and God says, if you want to grow in your compassion, you've got to see it like I see it, and then you've got to go for it. You've got to have some courage. We can't have weak-minded Christians. We can't have weak-minded people serving God. We're going to have to have people that are willing to go to the prisons, that are going to be willing to go into the neighborhoods, to go on prayer walks, to go feed the hungry, to wherever God has called you to go, he's going to give you the courage. There's a willingness. There has to be a willingness for us to get in the game and to roll up our sleeves. I'll never forget, Pastor GF is here. Back in the day, Pastor, we did, a, we did a, an outreach, and we went to go fix a lady's trailer house. See, this is one of the reasons why I believe believers don't want to get in the game. And I'm going to use this illustration. We went into this trailer house, and we were supposed to change a floor out because it was rotted. So we were going to take a toilet out, cut, the, cut it out, put a new piece of plywood. So I grabbed my two tools that I had, <laughs> my crescent wrench and my socket set. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> I took a team with me, and we went down there. But, you know, it was one of those deals where the more we took out, the worse it got. Come on, anybody ever have a project like that where you're like, okay, well, we'll just change this out. And we pull off that thing, and it's like, whoa, we got bigger issues. I mean, it, 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 sometimes when, when we think about getting involved in kingdom things, we don't want to admit it. But in the back of our minds, we're thinking, do I really want to pull the cover off this thing? Come on, be honest. How, can we be real? You know you think it. You know, I don't think like that, Pastor. I'm, real, I'm ready to get in the game. Because sometimes it's messy. When you go into the world with the gospel, it'll be messy. When you try, I, want, I love our pro-life ministry. Because our pro-life ministry is not just a sidewalk ministry. We will take a young lady who decides to keep the baby and see it through. All the way through. As long as it takes and whatever it costs. <laughs> Do you understand? It's one thing to hold a sign. It's another thing to rent a house for a mama. Are you with me? That's a whole nother thing. That's the biggest argument out there against with pro-life and pro-choice. It's like, yeah, you want them to keep it, but what are you going to do when they decide to keep it? Somebody's got to come alongside. Somebody's got to throw a baby shower. Somebody's got to see them. Through. Somebody's got to help mama get a driver's license. Somebody's got to be an advocate for her to get all of, the, of, the, of the, the programs that are available to her. Somebody's got to walk with her. Somebody's got to father her. Somebody's got to mother her. Come on. It takes courage. And you're going to get dirty. It ain't going to fit into your nice little legalistic religious plan. <laughs> We're going to have to put it under the blood later. Come on, somebody. Are y'all all right? It's okay? Oh, man, I'm, I don't like that. We got to put it. 
Jesus is saying to us, we've got to be willing to get our hands dirty, to roll up our sleeves. The other thing this, it says in the scripture that he bound up his wounds pouring in oil and wine. When you get ready to show up somewhere, you better have some oil and some wine. Now, I don't want you to go down to Specs and get some wine. <laughs> I'm not talking about that kind of wine. Let me give you a little symbolism here of what I believe oil and wine. Wine is what we drink when we t- take communion. It's symbolic of the blood of Christ. When you show up to a situation like that, you've got to have the blood of, you've got to show up with the message of the blood of Jesus and that Jesus forgives sins. You've got to show up. See, it's not enough to bandage the outside wound. You've got to disinfect the inside wound. You've got to show up with the blood of Jesus, the only thing that can wash away their sin. You've got to be able to show up and say, you can't just feed the people. You've got to give them the gospel. Because everybody does humanitarian aid. Can I help you with that? Everybody does. Humanitarian aid is not, the difference between the church's humanitarian aid is the gospel. Is that we're not just going to feed you, we're going to introduce Jesus to you. So when you show up with wine, you're showing up with the gospel. Are you washed in the blood? Can you talk about it? Because if you're not washed in it, you won't talk about it. Have you experienced the blood of Christ, the the washing of all of your sin away? Have you experienced the forgiveness that God gives you at the cross? You can't give somebody what you don't have. And then there's the oil because the blood is incomplete without the oil. We're we're going to talk about that at Easter. See, it's not just the cross. It's the fact that he raised from the dead that gives the power to the cross. So you don't just have to show up with the cross, you got to show up with the Holy Ghost. You got to show up and tell that person, not only has he washed all your sin away, not only has he cleansed you, he's also dropped, given you the Holy Spirit to enable you to walk in his ways for the rest of your days. He's like, he didn't just save you and leave you. He's not just saving you to leave you. He's saving you, empowering you, giving you authority so that when you walk down this road the next time you're around, you'll remember your ditch experience, and when you walk to somebody else in the ditch, you'll stop because somebody stopped for you. Somebody stopped for you. I love that they use wine for disinfecting in the old days. <laughs> for disinfecting. I thought, that, man, God disinfected me from all of my sin. When I, when I got under the blood of Jesus, he took away all of my sin, and then he empowered me. He, 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 he rubbed the oil all over my wounds. It's a picture of what Jesus did for us. Then the last thing he did is he took care of him. Come on, he took care of him. I love this scripture. It says, then he set him on his own donkey. His own donkey. He didn't call the church to borrow a donkey. Hey, you got a, you got a, can I, <laughs> you got a donkey I can borrow? He took his own resources He took his own resources and he said, with my own resources, I'm going to take care of you. Isn't that what Jesus did? He took all of him and he says, I got you. Isn't it funny how we can get to a place where we feel like God's dropped us? Or when we get in a circumstance where we feel like, man, I don't know. This one might not get me. This this one might get me. This one might... And God's like, I didn't bring you all this way to just leave you here in the ditch. I've moved for you many times, and I'll continue to move for you. And I know you're not seeing what you think you want to see right now, but it's okay. I'm still moving. I'm still God. I'm still going to move. I'm still going to do things that you can't see. I'm going to do things that you can't do. I learned something about a Christian 
a real Christian is a person of sacrifice. Now, hold, hold, hold with me. I'm not just talking money. I'm talking about being inconvenienced. I'm talking about letting, go, letting my preferences go. I'm talking about having plans and those plans changing because something changes because somebody shows up in a ditch. It takes sacrifice. We can say it, in the, we can say it when we're sitting in church that I'm going to do it, but it's a whole other thing when you run up on it. When you run up on it, what are you going to do? Are you going to cross the road to the other side? Are we going to take responsibility? Are we going to see like God sees? Are we going to be willing to be inconvenienced? There's things in my life that I, I, I have routines that I try to follow, and, and they get interrupted. There's birthdays that get interrupted. There's holidays that get interrupted. There's anniversaries that get interrupted because we signed up for something that requires sacrifice. And when we sacrifice, compassion comes because you'll have compassion over the people that you're sacrificing for. We won't have compassion over something that cost us nothing. And let me tell you something. Something, you know, we always talk about influence. Leadership is influence. You've heard that? Leadership is influence. Can I tell everybody in here that you're a leader? In some capacity, you're a leader. You're leading your house. You're leading your children. You're leading your work. Do you know what gains you influence? It doesn't, it doesn't just come. It is earned and gained through sacrifice. When I sacrifice for my family... I gain influence in my wife, and she willingly follows me and submits to me. Do you see what I'm saying? Sometimes we teach on submission between a man and a woman. Men, if, if your wife is not submitting to you, you're not sacrificing enough. you got to die more. <laughs> that went over like a lead balloon. <laughs> Ladies, you missed the chance to Amen. <laughs> That's funny. That was funny. I mean, I saw that thing like, bloop. It landed right there. Sacrifice. When I give my life, when I give my life, when I give my life, people notice that I'm giving my life, and people say, I can get, I can get behind that. That's influence. Not manipulation. Influence. True influence comes from Sacrifice. So if you, if, I, I guarantee you that Samaritan had a voice in that, ditch, that guy in the ditch's life after that story. Do you think? He'd probably show up at his house, man, thank you, brother. Man, I'm so glad you stopped. You, and, and it wasn't just lip service because he really did pay for everything. He put him on his own donkey. He paid with his own money. He told the innkeeper, anything that he charges up, it's on me. So what's your gaze on today? What are you glancing at today? Are the things of God a glance and the things of the world your gaze? Or do we switch that and we glance at the things of the world but we gaze on the things of God? Stand to your feet with me as we close. Now if you're in here today, I want nobody moving around. Maybe you're in here today and you're far from God. For whatever reason, you've, been, you've served God before, but you're far from him right now. You don't have a relationship with him. And you know you do or you know you don't. Everybody in here that's an adult knows, I know the Lord or I don't know the Lord. Maybe you're in here today and you don't know the Lord. You'd never had an encounter. I shared this with the first service. <clears throat> the reason that I can keep going and not quit is I remember the day that I encountered Jesus. I had a real encounter with him. When I had my encounter with him, listen to me, church, when I had my encounter with him, I wish I could tell you that everything just fixed by the next day, but it didn't. I struggled and I fought, 
But the only thing that I could hang on to was that I was different. I knew something was different because I used to live my life a certain way and I wouldn't think twice about how I lived it. But when I gave my life to Christ, I, I started to, to, to care about my running around and my, my drinking and my drugging and my, the stuff that I came out of. Some of us think we're broken because we've given our life to Jesus, but we're still struggling with sin. But I'm going to tell you that the fact that you're in here today means the Holy Spirit is moving on the inside of you because you don't feel the same about it anymore. You can't do what you used to do without feeling conviction. And you need to hang on to that because I had to hang on to that for my first three to four years of salvation. That's all I had. I was trying to be better, but I would fall and I would get up and fall and get up and fall. I'm telling you, there's hope. So I don't know where you are. You may not even know him. You may, you, may, you may be looking at, listen, I had an encounter with God. I remember the day that he pulled me out of my mess. And I have to go back to that encounter all the time. That's what holds me. That's what keeps me. It's not that I, my life has no problems. It's that I go back to the encounter. And if you don't have that encounter, nothing can hold you. See, a program can't hold you. A curriculum can't hold you. Powerhouse Church can't hold you. Only an encounter with God can hold you. Religion can't hold you. Legalism can't hold you. You gotta have an encounter. And I'm opening this altar right now. And I said this last week, I'll say it again. This is not a platform. Performances are on platforms. This is an altar. Sacrifice happens at an altar. If you're ready to lay your life down and say, Lord, I'm going to give you my life. I want to give you everything that I have. Come on, I don't care how long you think you've been serving God. How, what, if you're a leader, if you're not right with him and you need to give your life to him today, you need to rededicate, you need to give yourself to him. I want you to get out of your chair and get to this altar like it's life and death. If it's not life and death, it's not going to stick. It's got to be life and death. Life and death. Who needs to come? You need to get out of your chair. Let them out of your chair and come. Life and death. It's not religion. It's not a church. It's not a program. It's a relationship with the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords who gave his life for you. He gave his life for you. He poured out himself that you might live. When you couldn't help yourself, he came to you. He rushed to you. Come on. Come on. Keep coming. Keep, I know there's more. Keep coming. Keep coming. Keep coming. Let them out of the seats. Let them out of the seats if they need to come. Jesus. 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 There's one road back. Anybody else? There's people still coming. Just let me give it a chance. Come on. Come on. Still coming. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Don't wait. Don't leave here not change. Don't leave here without giving God a chance to move on you. What if today's the day? of your encounter. What if today's the day? There's one road back to God. Only one. It never changes. It's repentance. That's the road back to Him. I don't know what, where you've been. I don't know what's happened. But all you've got to do right now is to say, Lord, forgive me for walking away from you, for not living for you, Forgive me, Lord God. Make me into a son. Make me into a daughter. That's all it takes is God, is you turning your heart to God. That's all it takes. The moment you moved from your chair, God came into your situation. It's not a prayer that we're going to pray. He came in the moment you moved. The moment you moved, faith dropped on the inside of you and gave you the ability to move. 
He gave you the ability to move. We're going to pray a prayer of agreement today. We're going to, church, I want you to pray it with me. Let's pray together. Say, Heavenly Father, thank you for saving me. I repent of all my sin. Wherever I failed, wherever I've been dishonoring, wherever I haven't been faithful, Lord, you've always been faithful. I give my life to you. Give me your Holy Spirit that I might live for you and bring you glory in all my ways and in all my life. In Jesus' name.